in-game understanding is very important for several reasons. One of them is that it makes it easier when you transpose or exchange pieces and reach the end game to know if it's a good ending or a bad ending. And it's kind of nice to get the good endings and not the bad endings. Uh, it's also, of course, uh, nice to have uh, a lot of knowledge about the ending when you're actually playing the ending because you will play it better. So let's have an example of a very common uh, discussion or uh, topic you will you will face when you're playing chess, and that is rook versus two minor pieces, which is better and why. In in general, uh, in the middle game, uh, you would prefer two minor pieces because you have more attacking force, so you have better chances of launching, launching an attack against the king. In the ending, often the rook is just as good as two minor pieces because it can uh, grab a lot of pawns. It's very good at uh, attacking pawns from different sides, and it's very hard to defend against the rook because it just keep changing direction. It's not like the bishop that's uh, colorblind or the knight that has short-legged. The, the rook has long range and can attack all squares on the board. But let's see an example. It's 25 years old. It's been that long uh, since I played against Erling Mortensen in the Danish championship. Uh, I'm white and I open with e4. I, nowadays I play e4, d4, c4, knight f3, but back then I played uh, exclusively e4. And he always plays a Sicilian, and in general he has been playing some kind of time and off or something, but uh, this time he chooses the knight of variation with a6, which is also known as the Cadillac of chess openings. And it's a favorite uh, among others, Kasparov. And uh, I'm a bit surprised that Nim Pomnici is not trying it against uh, Carlsen, but he might next time. Uh, he'll be black instead of the Petrov. Anyway, um, this is all the main classical line. And back then, King H1 was the all the rage. And, um, and I was uh, having very good results with this move uh, in general. The problem is for, for black is that, that b5 is, is a good answer against f4, but if he plays b5 now, then a4 is strong. So if he plays b5, I would just go a4 and uh, attack his queen side and, and having not weakened this pawn here. So this is supposed to be pretty nice for white, and uh, black has stopped playing b5, and instead of uh, trying for different kind of moves, Bishop e6, knight c6, knight e7, queen c7, uh, b6 is also not a bad move. Uh, and with the idea f4, b5, I think, in, in general. Uh, Erling played knight c6, and I play this move, f4, and we reach this position where, in general, you can say that white has won uh, one tempo because he got to play. Uh, bishop c1 takes f4 without positioning it here first. So that's an, a slight, slight achievement. Nevertheless, this position is pretty uh, equal. Black is fine. Uh, white has, uh, you could say that he has, like, um, controls the, the first four rows and black control the First three rows on this side, and we are playing about uh, the fifth rank. Uh, and of course, white has a weak pawn here, black has a weak pawn here, and besides from that, everybody has free piece play and so on. White can sometimes use his slight space advantage to launch an attack on the king. Bcb6. Here there are two moves. Knight d4 was supposed to be good, so that's what I did. But I think uh, another move that's not bad is queen e1. Anyway, I played this move. Take, uh, take. And I think in, in general, uh, exchanges is not bad for black. And I, I play this. And if, if black is just allowed to play this move, and here he will have equalized uh, without any kind of trouble. But he's not allowed to because that would lose a pawn. And even though it's not the greatest pawn, it's still a pawn. And I play rook d2, just ganging up on uh, on this one here. And I'm having an initiative. Rook d7 is a little bit clumsy. 
and rook comes in, rook b8, and he's getting ready for, if he plays b5, before the rook is here, I will play a4, but now I can just play a4 anyway, uh, trying to undermine his his king side, queen side, I mean. Rook c8, all natural, and I'm starting to, my queen is not well placed in this situation here, so I decided to reposition it, and I'm aiming for this square, where it both attacking this way, but also attacking this way, which is nice to have um, clear near his king. The, the g3 square is often good for, for black in these positions. So queen e3, so I think, is a good move. And queen c5 was probably a mistake. Uh, the ending is not that great. Uh, the thing is that if, if I don't go for the ending, his queen will be very active. It could go here, but it could also facilitate something like knight h5. So taking is, is, is necessary. And he, of course, has to take back with the pawn, which was not the intention, because it sort of ruined his uh, advantage with his structure. And e5, I'm opening this diagonal here. Oops, sorry. That was the wrong button again. And hoping to to attack his uh, his weakened uh, queen side, take take here and here, all very good. Uh, and I was kind of uh, optimistic here because I also I have uh, some ideas with with oops, now I did it again um, with with this move. So uh, very interesting. And he played rook b8 covering the pawn. Okay, here is the big question. Should I take d7 and play e6 or not? That is uh, a, a big question. First of all, one of the things you could ask yourself is, what if I don't do it? Will, will, uh, how will I continue my attack? The problem is, he's, he, he guarded this one. I have very active pieces, but there's not really any way to improve them. I could play the knight here, but I think he will just move the bishop maybe to d8, uh, controlling the knight. And it's, it's hard to make progress in this kind of position. And meanwhile, uh, black is probably threatening something like this and starting to become active on the queen side. So it's probably a good idea to do something and i decided that this was good it all um, so he will get um, he will get uh, uh, i'll get two minor pieces and he get a rook and a pawn in general you could say that materially wise that's equal that's equal you you uh, something like i have six pawn, uh, pawns you have six pawns but the thing is the big question is if these uh, minor pieces can work together and find good squares, or if they can't. If they can work together and, and find good squares, then I would probably be much better. If they can't, then the rook would be very uh, active. And imagine the rook uh, going, uh, going on a hunt and, and, and getting these ones, and it will be very annoying. It will be very hard to get counterplay. The thing is, the you have to have sort of footholds for your, your positions, especially the knight needs a good place to stay. Anyway, I'm threatening the, the rook, so um, so he has to, to go and uh, take, take. And here, of course, uh, very important, immediately uh, climbing down on the white squares uh, and and attacking. Of course, I'm attacking the bishop, maybe, but, uh, but most of all, I'm just controlling... Um, uh, his rook with my knight. Oops, that was a, that was not in the intention. Keeps doing that. Um, bishop d6. That's maybe not the best move. Uh, it looks good. And here is another question for you. Your understanding of this position. Should you take or should you go? And it's actually very uh, clear that you should not take. You have uh, black, white has the bishop pair and uh, and very active pieces, and it's kind of easy to shut this bishop out of the game, and uh, and 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 even though the, the the advantage black has is due to the white squares, it will be 
e, there will also be something to attack on the black square. So if we can make this bishop into a ghost, it would be very strong. So black plays this move, and that's a that's a pretty good move. And by the way, it carries a threat. I'm threatening this move. Winning uh, the rook. <laughs> so he has to do something, and it's not easy because the, the natural move would be something like this. But then, book, and there is a check. So there was a small trick. So it seems black already has serious uh, problem to solve, and this knight here is is very strong. The the thing, the reason I I, I had when I played this when I took uh, on, on d7, I hadn't seen that this position was probably very good. I could just see that I would get a very strong knight on d5, and his rook would not become active, and that is most certainly the biggest key to this position is to avoid uh, the opponent's pieces becoming very active, especially the rook here. So if you can keep the rook uh, locked down, you're, uh, you're in great shape. Here he played, I don't know what he should play, but he played this move, which looks very natural, uh, setting the pawns in motion. And of course, I mean, he's hoping I would take and take, and then there will be another open file, and he will be able to penetrate with the rook um, to, to a1 or something but there is a problem and uh, and the, <laughs> it's all already uh, pretty serious because uh, the rook has no good squares if he goes to here then I will just play this move attacking here and here and when he goes to defend I will uh, win something the rook is simply the the bishop is simply lost so instead he played here but doesn't help rook d8 and here comes a very strong move and um, this is one of the my main strengths especially in the end game is the theme of domination so i'm dominating the rook it cannot move and i'm setting up this really nasty threat of knight c uh, c8 and there's nothing he can do the rook is simply uh, doesn't have enough uh, range to to deal with this problem and he's lost he played bcb7 played knight c8 and attacking both uh, things and of course uh, the knight can easily get out from a7 that's not a problem in these kind of positions especially with with opposite colored bishops it's kind of easy to to get out so, and yeah, and this of course is, 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 is absolutely hopeless. G4, and here uh, Erling resigned. Uh, the, the ending is, is, is winning very easily. Uh, I'll just walk in with the king on, on, the, on the white squares and, and win something, and, and this bishop will never do anything. So, here is uh, the key takeaway from this uh, game. A rook is often very strong against two minor pieces in the ending if the rook is active and has something it can attack. If it cannot get out, it cannot attack anything, then the minor pieces are better. The key for the player with the minor pieces is to get them to coordinate as best as possible so that they will work together uh, and attack something and keep the rook under control this was of course a very uh, sort of easy example of, uh, of the rook just being totally helpless uh, very quickly but but it, it the the principles applies against uh, in in most cases and 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 you can use that in your games that to think okay should i go for the bishop and uh, knight versus rook well, depends. How does my pieces? Uh, how do, do my pieces uh, coordinate? Can I keep the black, the the, the opposite rook, from becoming active? And uh, and do can I uh, get stable positions for for my pieces and maybe dominate the rook? Then it's a good idea. If the rooks become sort of a, like a tiger tank that just rolls over the board, attacks everything, then maybe it's not such a good idea. This was uh, GM Talks, and thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.